Hi everyone, this short video is about understanding imagery and we're going to be using art to kind of show you how images can work in literary texts. So the first thing we need to do is define imagery and people often think that imagery means just visual images or words that make pictures in your mind, but it's actually broader than that. The um, imagery can be defined as the use of figurative language or descriptive language to represent objects, actions, and or ideas in a way that relates to our five senses. So what's really important when we're dealing with imagery, and this is going to be especially important when we get to poetry, is that Imagery is not just about what we see. It's also about touch, hearing, taste, and smell. Anytime an author is describing any of these kind of sensory perceptions, that counts as an image. Now, imagery comes in two ways. The first and easiest to kind of wrap your head around is descriptive. Descriptive imagery tends to be very straightforward. These are um, descriptions that portray lifelike settings, characters, or events. We know, for instance, that a character is not just a girl, but is a girl of a certain age who has a certain color hair and a certain sort of skin and a certain type of voice. We know, for instance, when a story starts on a dark and stormy night, that something is going to happen that is dark and stormy. Um, Descriptive imagery is really used to bring the reader into the story and to establish a vivid world for the reader to be immersed into. This is especially important in fiction. In fiction, the goal of a writer is often what is called verisimilitude, which means the appearance of a reality. So that when we read a piece of fiction, we are not reading a new story, but we're reading a fictional world that feels real to us as readers. But there's another kind of imagery that's used in both fiction and drama and poetry, and that's figuratively used imagery. So figurative language and other sorts of images are used to draw comparisons and really is especially important to establish tone. So let's look at some art and how imagery works in art. Take a look at this, one of the most famous paintings in the history of painting, the Mona Lisa. Right? This is done in the 1500s. Um, it's a really classic example of realism and how the Renaissance kind of transformed painting to do more realistic work. But take a look at what we actually see in this picture. How does the picture make you feel? Is this woman happy? Is she sad? Is she afraid? Is she in the middle of a war-torn country, or is she in the middle of something very peaceful? Um, the look on her face is one thing, but take a look at the background. We have soft colors, but they're a bit dark. In the foreground, you have dark, deep shadows, and that kind of contrast means that certain parts, especially her face, are highlighted. This is not a scary painting. Right? This is a painting that we've probably seen so much that we don't even really look at when it comes up. But what we can see in this is that the artist uses certain colors, certain brush strokes, certain tones to help evoke a feeling of peacefulness, of calm. Compare that with this, a really famous painting of, of Liberty by a French artist. So in this, Again, you have these kind of bright and dark areas, but if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you see the dead lying wounded and bleeding and crumpled. Um, you see the light area up above with the flag of France flying bravely. You see the looks on people's faces, how they're shadowed. Um, this painting, even with the horror and the death down below, is a victorious painting. We get the feeling from this painting that the artist wanted us to feel that this is a moment of triumph, not a moment of pain and sorrow. And we get this through imagery. Take a look at the smoke in the background. It's highly realistic. You can practically smell the rifles firing. Um, you can practically sense what it would be like to step on the fallen bodies. Here's another one. This is another really famous painting by Andrew Wyeth. Um, an artist who is really known for his realism. Here you see a young girl in a field of grass looking up to a lonely farmhouse. Like, there's nothing overly exciting about this painting. She's in a big brown field. 
The house is gray in the background, kind of cast in shadows. The sky is not particularly blue. And yet, there's something strangely hopeful about this painting, isn't there? Her dress being a rosy pink, maybe, instead of a gray. Or perhaps it's the way she seems to be leaning in towards the house. There's something about this painting that doesn't feel depressing. It feels almost hopeful because of the colors and the shapes and the imagery used. Now, not all art is realistic, and not all of the details you get in poems or short stories are going to be realistic either. If you take a look at this, this is the um, impressionistic painting Cezanne, by Cezanne, I mean. And in this, there's really no clear idea of what this is. This is not realism. But we can still get a sense of a small house in the background, perhaps a mill behind some trees, and the idea that we're looking out over water. Again, it's not realistic, but we get a sense from the brush strokes, how uneven or ragged or smooth they are. But this isn't necessarily a house in a storm. This is a fairly peaceful painting, if not a bit depressing. Or we could perhaps look at something from Picasso's Blue Period. This is fairly realistic for Picasso, isn't it? Usually we think of Picasso as noses in the wrong places. But the cast of this painting in different shades of blues makes this guitar player seem quite sad and depressed. This is not a guitar player playing a bright flamenco dance. This is a mournful painting. And it happens pretty much primarily because of the color and because of the way he's hunched over on his guitar. Or, take this, a famous painting by the artist Jackson Pollock. This is a painting of nothing, right? What's the subject? We don't know. It splatters on the canvas. But it's kind of angry, isn't it? With the dark blacks and the bright reds, with the kind of violent way that it's splattered all over the place. When you look at this painting, you don't get a feeling of calm. You get a feeling of being unsettled, that the artist was perhaps mad at his paints and his canvases. Unlike Kandinsky, who paints with such bright, vibrant, alive colors that you can almost hear the music in this painting, right? That this is alive and happy, and there's nothing dark or scary about this particular painting. Again, who knows what it is? There's no discernible shapes or descriptions. But there's something in the imagery that gives us a sense of tone. The same sort of thing is going to happen in fiction and in poetry. In poetry, you might get images much like Kandinsky's or Jackson Pollock's. Images that don't necessarily tell you a clear description, but give you an impression of a feeling. And it's your job to kind of decide what that feeling is. Let's look at one more painting. This is a really famous painting by Turner. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the title quite yet, but if you look at this painting, it's clear that there's a ship. It's clear that there's some sort of storm going on. Um, there's bright sun in the background, so it doesn't seem like a completely depressing painting, and yet there's a violence to it when we look at it. But taking the impression kind of overall doesn't really give us the whole of this painting. And taking the impression of a literary text overall doesn't give us enough either. The key to looking at images in literary texts is that you take the part and you compare it to the whole. So here is the whole painting. A ship at sea in the middle of what might be a sunset or a sunrise or a storm. But let's look down in the lower right hand corner. If you had a sharp eye in the last painting or if you've seen this before, perhaps you know this little detail. But down in the lower right hand of the paint corner of the painting is a small detail that from a distance we might overlook. And that's a detail of a leg and a manacle. This painting is called Slave Ship in a Storm. And what it's depicting 
is the moment that a ship has to let go of cargo to be lighter to outrun the storm. In this case, the cargo or people. If we had taken this as just a pretty picture, because it looks pretty when we first look at it, and we didn't look closely down in that lower right-hand corner of the fish who are now swarming around the dead bodies, sinking with their ankles manacled in iron, we miss the overall point of the picture, which is the violence of slavery. In the same way, we want to look at the details of the images compared to the whole picture. What is Turner saying here in this picture? Well, there is beauty at sea and with ships, but there is true horror, isn't there, when we look at what's being transported. So this was a brief introduction of the way art visually can show us what literature does with words. As you read the short stories and later the poems, you'll want to pay attention to a couple things. First and foremost, what's your gut reaction? When we look at a painting, like Picasso's Blue Period, our gut reaction is that the painting is kind of depressing, right? Or when we look at something like the painting of Liberty, even with all the death and destruction, there's a sense of victory in this painting. We don't have to be an art historian to know that. And you don't have to be an expert at literature to understand that when you read a story, if your gut is telling you there's something going on that's dark here, you're probably right. The second thing that you want to really pay attention to, though, is detail. It's not enough to go with the big picture. You have to reread looking for how the details helped create that impression. In this particular painting, we have the way that light shines on the victory instead of on the death. In the Andrew Wyeth painting, we see the way that the girl is foregrounded in a rosy pink dress that despite the kind of dull looking background that she's in, that she stands out and it gives the painting a sort of hopefulness. In the Kandinsky, the use of bright, bold, contrasting colors is nowhere as violent as the contrast of the blood red and the dark black of a Jackson Pollock. So as you study your stories and your poems and your drama, I want you to kind of keep this in mind and think about if this were represented visually, what would the story be doing? But remember, images are more than visuals. Think about sounds, tastes, touch, and smell.